Okay, welcome everybody to Hiking My Feelings Virtual Campfire. My name is Sydney Williams and I'm your host. I'm the founder and author of Hiking My Feelings and uh, we are really excited to have you here today. We have an awesome show coming up for you. Today we have a conversation with the Confluence Collective, a collection of angle fly fisher, anglers and fly fishers. <laughs> I don't speak fishing fluently, so that's why they're here. Um, and we're going to be talking with Gabachia, Serene, Bree, and Ashley about all things equity in the outdoors and diversity. So we'll hop into that in a second. We also have our favorite um, blues musician here in San Diego, Shane Hall, is joining us as well, live from Pacific Coast Spirits. I am sitting here at Beach Hut Deli. This is in Rancho San Diego, which is land of the Kumeyaay people. And while we get jumped into the good stuff here, I'm going to share some updates about Take a Hike Diabetes. So um, so far, we have hiked 6,473 miles for Take a Hike Diabetes towards our million mile goal. So we only have like 994,000 to go. Not a big deal. We can totally make it. And we'll do that with your help. So if you haven't registered yet, you can do that at hikingmyfeelings.org slash diabetes. We currently have 94 participants registered, $3,950 raised. And as a reminder from our sponsors at Ross Chocolates, we are giving away three packs of their delicious sugar-free chocolate this month. And you can be entered to win one of those three packs by raising $25 within the Kilter app this month and or completing 14 activities for diabetes awareness, whether that's a run, a trail run, a walk, a hike, a meander through nature, a rolling workout if you're in a wheelchair. We want to make this as inclusive as possible. So if you're tracking distances and you're registered on Kilter, we appreciate you. Thank you to everybody who signed up so far. And looking ahead to next month, we have some incredible prizes available. Um, last week, we introduced Solomon and welcomed them to the Hiking My Feelings family. So as a reminder, every month for the rest of the year moving forward, if you log at least four activities in the Kilter app, you are entered to win a free pair of the X Ultra 4 GTX shoes from Solomon. They are amazing. I am so excited for you to win these. And we also have some amazing prizes that we're getting ready to announce in the next few weeks. So be sure to stick around for that. Um, I really am excited for the folks that we have here today. I'm going to introduce Gabachia, and then she's going to introduce um, all of the people that are here today for our panel. Gabachia is our director of social responsibility. She is exploring responsibly wherever she goes. And she recently wrote a knock down, drag out, awesomely inspiring and totally necessary piece for Backpacker Magazine called Leave No Trauma. And today we're going to be exploring Leave No Trace principle number seven, which is be considerate to others. And I'm going to let you take it from here, Gabaccio. Welcome to the show. It's so nice to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a great time to, you know, spend these hour or these couple hours with the Hiking My Feelings community and everybody that joins um, in, you know, YouTube or after the fact during the podcast. Um, well, I, don't, I personally don't want to introduce my folks. I would like to give the mic to each of them to introduce themselves. But I do want to say that because Sydney, you mentioned my article, Leave No Trauma, that was kind of a little bit of the inspiration behind today just to think, thinking about the seventh principle of leave no trace and we'll get into what leave no trace is and all of that fun stuff. But just to think about um, our ethics as a guiding framework for our own personal equity work in specifically in the outdoors. Cause that's a, I find it as a common ground that we all have when we care for the outdoors, we practice ethics when we are there. But I think that tells a lot about what we do when we're not there too. So all of these things intersect and we'll dive into some of that next. So I'll pass it on to Serene so that she can introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Serene. Um, she, hers are my pronouns and I'm here on the stolen land of the Bitterroot Salish in Missoula, Montana. So excited to be uh, on the podcast today in this room, hanging out with folks that are uh, trying to to do do work. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Ashley, do you want to take it? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashley White. I hail from Minnesota. Um, the land that I'm currently sitting on was uh, that of the Dakota. Uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, look forward to the conversation, not only uh, with you all and also my confluence friends. 
Thank you. And then last but not least, Bree. And Bree, can you also tell us a little bit about Confluence since you are the founder? Sure. So I am Bree. My pronouns are she, hers. Today, I am joining you from my home, which is in Maine and stolen lands of the Wabanaki Confederacy tribes. And a few years ago, I started Confluence Collective, um, recognizing that, especially in angling, it's a very white, very male dominated space. And even as a woman holding uh, female cis hetero identities, it was still a space that didn't feel totally welcoming, um, really exclusive. And so Confluence Collective started to, ins to ensure that we all had an opportunity to be on the water, do so in ways that we're comfortable and feel belonging while we're out there. So we exist as uh, an entity which disrupts the cultural norms that exist now. And we do so through diverse perspectives that can be a part of curating the culture that we need to be whole when we are in the water or near the water or generally outside. Uh, so we started with programming, COVID happened. Now we do a lot of storytelling, educational resources and really fun collaborations. And I am so fortunate to have Serene and Kabachi and Ashley um, joining in with that mission. They're incredible people. Excited to be here today. Ah, thank you so much, Bree, for that intro. Um, so diving right into what we're here to talk about today, I want to start, I'm going to share my screen and I have a very humble presentation for you all, but I just don't want to make assumptions that we all know what the leave no trace is and what the seventh principle is about. So I'm just going to go through kind of the basics, make sure we're all on the same page. So here we go. So what is Leave No Trace? And I put pretty much all the info here so we can share this presentation after the fact and you guys could have it as a reference. But basically, Leave No Trace is what we call the guiding principles of ethics that is pretty much started for backcountry recreationists uh, to take care of the backcountry and wilderness areas, but has really evolved into applying to uh, front country hikes, your backyard, your local parks, I mean, your everyday life if you're kind of like me. Um, so each of the principles is offering a framework that covers a specific topic that often impacts the outdoor experience and the outdoor environment and trying to mitigate those impacts so that we have plenty of nature to enjoy for future generations. And I also wanted to call out the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics because they are kind of the nonprofit entity that is truly fully dedicated to doing a lot of research and creating educational tools and spreading the word about Leave No Trace and trying to implement these as guidelines for all the areas where we recreate. And you can find out more at their website, lnt.org just really easy to remember. And so a lot of times you'll say, you'll hear people say LNT and that's short for leave no trace. So what the seven principles are is the first one is plan ahead and prepare. Classic, when you're gonna go on a hike, you plan, you see the weather, you make sure that the roads are open and that you're gonna be able to get to where you wanna go safely and, and come out safely as well. The second principle, travel and camp on durable surfaces. We wanna be mindful of our impacts. If areas are already impacted, we wanna camp there. We don't wanna pitch our tent in a fresh grass that uh, hasn't been impacted yet whenever possible. Um, traveling on the durable surface, that's the trail, that's rock, um, that's sand. Depending on where you are, you have to pay attention to where the vulnerable soils are and know what those are, et cetera, et cetera. Disposing of waste properly, you know, from your own personal waste to the trash that you bring in. We say pack it in, pack it out, preferably, even if there are trash cans. Uh, we know that our public lands are not uh, really properly staffed for the amount of traffic that they get these days. So I say just pack it in, pack it out is a great a great way to support them. Uh, leave what you find. You know, you're walking. We normally see a little pretty rocks, uh, maybe pretty animals too. We don't take those home. We try to leave them there so that more people can enjoy them. Uh, minimizing campfire impacts. That, you know, being super aware of the laws and regulations around building campfires for 
a lot of places, those are very sensitive. Respecting wildlife, you know, knowing to not get close to wildlife, it's really just the best practice, but respecting them and, and yeah, basically not try to take a selfie with them. <laughs> and the seventh principle, be considered of other visitors. And that's what we're gonna focus today and kind of how we are pulling a framework to, to dive deeper into what that means. So the seventh principle, it's one of the most, this is directly from the Leaf No Trace website. So they say one of the most important components of outdoor ethics is to maintain courtesy toward other visitors. It helps everyone enjoy the outdoor experience. So sure, we can all agree to that. And what I wanna to propose today is that if we are going to be courteous to each other, that's probably no longer enough, right? And when we think about our historical moment, when we think about all the civil unrest that we've experienced and witnessed in the past couple of years, but really all throughout history, just being courteous and giving someone a superficial smile is no longer enough. So I want to argue that if we're going to be truly considerate of each other, if we're going to understand each other's histories, we're going to understand each other's roles in this world, in the places where we recreate, in the communities that, that we impact, in the identities that we hold. So let me stop the share for just a second, because I want to open it up. I asked my co-facilitators here today to bring a story to share that either relates to Leave No Trace and hopefully in particular to how we practice being considerate of, of others or how we have experienced a conflict with others' uh, consideration of ourselves. So is, is anybody wanting to, to jump on and and share, or do you all want me to kick it off? I, Brie, take it. I can go. <laughs> <laughs> take it, Brie. Yeah, um, so when we, when Gabachi reached out about this conversation, um, I was excited because the seventh principle reminds me of a framework that I use around being a good riverbank buddy. And that's a way of just thinking about how we want to share company in nature and support one another. And for me, a good riverbank buddy is that is someone who can share enthusiasm and might be ready to like lend a hand netting a fish if it's too big or something that I offer for my riverbank buddies as well. Um, it's not somebody that would lurk around or assume uh, that I don't know something out there. So someone that respects and understands that we're interacting as ourselves and informed in whatever ways. Um, this is something that has come up just in fly fishing. You know, they don't whistle or make inappropriate or sexually suggestive remarks. That's something that happens, unfortunately, still in a, in a very white male dominated area. Um, they don't ask me if I'm shopping for a present for my boyfriend, if I'm just trying to get flies. Uh, that has happened multiple times. And those are just easy ones. I think more importantly here in this moment, it's beyond just being able to do these very normal things for me and recognizing that I hold a lot of privileges even in those moments. I would say like a good riverbank buddy also recognizes that we all have different and unique relationships to the land and to the water that we're visiting. And we hold space for that. And we hold space for the emotionality and uh, the healing and growth that happens there as we interact with it as very complicated humans. Um, and maybe they don't judge me just based on my back cast, like a little bit of compassion and love there. Um, and being able to hold that for each other because ultimately, you know, it's all about that growth chart and continuing to move and be thoughtful and do better. Um, so is that all right, get us started? <laughs> yeah, no, th thanks for bringing that up because I think that calls out to the I, I what I would think is the biggest element of this, which is being aware of yourself, right? So for all the white men that have told you, oh, are you buying a gift for your boyfriend when you're at the fly shop? That is someone that is absolutely unaware of, you know, the biases that they hold because they're being so blatantly open about it, right? So 
I think that's, and that's definitely like the first step awareness and self introspection. And we'll, we'll get to, to more of that today. So thank you Brie for, for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to call out on Ashley because I see that he's, he's very ready. I'm, I'm just kind of stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Um, some of the dimensions of difference that uh, regarding the principle that we're talking about for me is the, the, the very obvious one um, the, of being a black man. And so if I am on the river and very um, uh, in a way that's not necessarily harmful or threatening, they're like, oh, I'm happy that you are here. And, and so that sort of um, tone of, of, of welcoming, but maybe not necessarily fully inclusive or that I don't actually belong there uh, is something that um, isn't necessarily based on gender, uh, but it is a, a, a welcoming that I, I receive. And so um, people on the river are generally welcoming, but that it, those types of, of nods um, from a consideration standpoint isn't always inclusive or makes me feel as though I, I belong. And so from a consideration standpoint, I think that's really an, an important understanding the language and even how uh, your intention versus your impact um, can affect the, the, the surroundings. Um, and, and even though people are, are normally well-meaning with those types of, of remarks, um, they do have an impact on, on individuals. Uh, the second note I, I would bring up is that I, I fish with um, children most frequently. I am a, I'm a father, I have four children, they range in ages and sizes. Um, and in the world of fly fishing, of um, <clears throat> etiquette and doing things properly, um, my kids frequently are still learning and sometimes will do things wrong. They will blow up a hole, for example, or um, walk through um, a swimming lane and people will get frustrated. And so like the, the, the immediacy of, of reminding of that, the grace of allowing um, um, children to learn in, in particular, being respectful of the space and, the, and remembering the time because fly fishing is um, such a treasure space for people we understand, but also rem remembering um, what it was like for them to learn to learn in this in this particular time now that they are expert anglers uh, and know all the rules and, and etiquette. And even when we are sort of even camp camping in the fishing on the fishing grounds, um, if we are in, um, you know, either the back country or um, even at a even at a campground that's local to us that has like quiet hour rules, um, so as I'm bedding down my children and um, um, people are, are still um, sort of partying and, and not mindful of the quiet hours, that's another thing that I, I just ask people to sort of remember to be mindful and courteous of like the dimensions that are currently all around us. So we don't, um, so we, everyone can continue to have an excellent experience. Good. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for bringing that point of, um, intention versus impact because we all know that you know the what is it the road to hell is paved with good intentions <laughs> and i you know it's it's just so it's, it's such a cheesy thing to say but it's so on point because it is true our intentions may be good but if we don't have the awareness that we were talking about then we are really not going to be able to measure the impacts that we can have on each other, right? So thank you so much, Ashley, for bringing that up. Do you have any like specific, um, I'm gonna pick on you for a second, Ashley, but do you have any specific examples of like a time in the river that something happened with like maybe discomfort with something that one of your kids did or some other remark that somebody uh, made to you? Yes, um, my eldest daughter, most frequently now won't return uh, into the most um, sort of remote spaces in, in parts of the state uh, because of a because of an issue that we've had um, sort of with some with some gentlemen that was was on there and so their their land backed up to the river and so as long as we were on the river we should have been fine um, but in this particular case um, there were a few gentlemen who um, sort of walked out there at the back door of the property with their with their firearms um, to remind us not to come onto their property. And so immediately, um, the you know the the role is for us to to you know safety first and to to remove. But that conversation, um, you know, with my children or even with my wife around safety in the backcountry as 
um, not only with my daughter, but just myself as a, a black man. And, th and that's an extreme example, right? That's not every time I go out, but the fact that it happened um, is still something that, um, and they, they may do that for everybody, right? I was just with my, with my daughter. And so I, I, I always try to, to think that it was not necessarily um, because I was a black man with his black daughter. Um, but that sort of um, just sort of ne neglect of, of individuals who were actually doing the, what they were supposed to be doing in that space um, was something that was harmful. Uh, and it is still a conversation um, in my family, especially when it comes to, to going fishing um, with my daughter. So I carry a, a GPS device um, so I can always be found if something were to happen. And this isn't like I'm going up a mountain. This is I'm just going fishing. Um, and so that's just the consideration that we now have to take after having moments like that. Um, and again, that's an extreme example of something that has happened while we've been out on the, on the water of, of individuals um, just sort of not being sort of fully con considerate in those who are compliant to what they were supposed to do. Um, but then there is like uh, lower, lower examples uh, or less severe examples um, where individuals uh, wanted to, to rush us off a fishing hole, for example, while, I was, while we were trying to instruct because they, they felt as um, though that was their fishing spot, even though it was a public space for us to fish. Um, so there, there are a number of things, different de degrees of, of, of levels of um, some even disrespectful in, in spaces, but um, just off the top of my head, those were the two that came to mind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that performance of authority that you've experienced with the person coming out, showing off their gun, and you weren't really doing anything wrong, um, that, you know, definitely um, it's one of those um, extremes that we all kind of fear and hope that we don't have to encounter when we are out there. Yeah, for sure. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Serene, I know you're ready to share too. Yeah, I, um, I think that this principle is an interesting one when it comes to the plus size community, which is where I identify in. So I use the word fat to describe myself, which isn't always the word that other people who are plus size use. And so um, from my own lived experiences as a fat person, fishing is, is a really unique, uh, it's unique in the sense that I'm not welcome from even the concept of fishing all the way through the action of doing it. And when I do catch fish or I do um, successfully land a pretty decent sized fish, oftentimes people will just assume someone caught that for me or just assume that I didn't do the work to walk to the river to get those fish. Um, and it wasn't really until um, recently that I was able to even find appropriate gear to make fishing something that I could do year round. And um, I, I love to fish in the summer. I think it's a, the best time to fish. I think most people would agree with me on that. But I think when it comes to, to being considerate of others or, or being open of, of the public of public lands and exploring the great outdoors together, there's a really um, kind of odd feeling when a fat person walks into the room or walks by you on the trail or walks up to you on the river in the sense that um, all of a sudden this must be a new concept for that fat person or this must be something that this is the first time they're doing this. And so even hiking or backpacking in to go fishing, people will look at me and and I'll be at the back of the pack, which is where I prefer to, to hike. And folks will say to me as they pass, like, wow, way to go. You're doing such a great job. And I've watched them pass so many people ahead of me who aren't fat or aren't plus size. And they don't say a single thing or they just say good day to them. Um, and they get to me and they feel like they have to be my cheerleader, which, which is a unique experience because it's not that I'm um, out of shape. I just don't look like the shape they expect me to look if I'm a person that's hiking or backpacking or moving in the woods frequently. So I think that this consideration of others is that we all have a story and we all have something that we're carrying with us as we move through the world. And, and when we treat other people differently, they 
it it's noticed, right? It's, it can be seen as, as this, wow, congratulations for making it to the top of this mountain, you fat person. And it's like, well, congratulations to all of us for carrying our own asses up this mountain. Cause it's not easy. And, um, I might be hiking this every single day and, and another person that's of quote unquote average size, um, might be their first time. And this is a really big accomplishment for that person. And so I think that that's kind of my own lived experience. That's my story that I get to tell. Um, that, that might not be the, the story for other folks that are, are larger than um, what the world thinks is quote unquote, the athletic body. I think that I'm learning in my life that all bodies are athletic. Some just have athletic pants that are made for them. Um, and so we all get to, to exist and make the world work for us as, as fat people. I really appreciate you sharing that Serene, because I, I think one of the points that you brought up that you just recently, uh, found gear that will fit you to fish outside of the summer. I mean, that's, that's the trickle effect of conservation, right? And we're, we're dabbling also into inclusion because obviously consideration is a big part of inclusion. And when you haven't been included in, or when your identity hasn't been included in a production of hiking pants or waiting um, or waiters or waiting boots or whatever that is, then of course you are not feeling already invited to try right. those activities. So there's, there's certainly a level of responsibility that brands also have, especially brands that do outdoor recreation because they quote unquote, mostly I would say stand behind leave no trace and try to uh, promote that in, in how they um, support their ambassadors or their athletes and things along those lines. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for bringing that I up. I think it's an interesting concept to be a fat person trying to find waiters for, um, there's a lots of waiters companies. There's lots of companies in the fishing industry that are making waiters. And when asking and reaching out genuinely to inquire for myself to be able to purchase waiters, they all point me to one single company. And that's not very common that folks or companies or competitors are like, oh, here, here's one place that's building it. Like if we all wanted a car and we only had one company that built us a car and no other car companies existed, then we, that would be so interesting to us, right? So the fact that companies are skating around their responsibility of being equitable to all by saying, well, one company is doing it and we're not going to invest. So go see this one company, which I work with and those are the waiters that I wear. However, I would like to see an opportunity and options that aren't exactly that one thing. So thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is, that is true that it's, it is a, a unique uh, situation in that, of course, if, you know, if I were to call a waiting company and be like, oh, you don't have my, sa or like if, if I went to the, the fly store and they didn't have my size, they'll order it from one of the brands that they already carry. They wouldn't tell me, oh, go next, go to the other fly fishing store and see if they have it, you know? Um, so I, I absolutely agree. Um, for myself, my relationship with, with this principle has really evolved over time. I think when I, when I got indoctrinated into conservation and as a, as a volunteer national park, I'm, I'm going to admit that I was, uh, a lot of the, what they call leave no trace police people <laughs> that were just like, and, and it was part of my job as a volunteer granted, like I, you know, had to make sure that people followed guidelines them and and figure out uh best best approaches to you know get people to follow the guidelines if they didn't know them or if they were uh, purposefully or consciously breaking them so that's kind of like my first interaction with the principles but um over time um you know i've been i've been in in different situations and one that came to mind as ashley was uh sharing about the backcountry and and people bringing in guns into into the scene um 
and I mean, it happened to me, but really not like I was, I was part of this. So what happened was that me and my boyfriend were planning on hiking Mount Baldy in LA and we were camping in the national forest the night before. And, you know, when you're hiking a big mountain, you want to wake up early and get a head start before the crowds and all of that. And normally if you're in a campground, there's quiet hours, 9 p.m., 8 p.m., depending on the campground. So, you know, there were people that had music and that's fine. You know, it's still not quite, quote unquote, quiet hours. Surely some of us much rather be in the quiet with the birds and, and all the, the sounds of the wind and the, and the trees. But, um, but, you know, it's okay. We get it. Some people, that's how they enjoy nature and it's cultural and there's all the different things. But, you know, when 11 o'clock at night comes around and there's still loud music and, you know, we figure we can go out and ask that maybe they can to- turn down the music since it's already quite hours. And so my boyfriend, who uh, uh, is a white Mexican, so, you know, people, when they see him, they don't see an identity that they associate with being Mexican or, um, or being a minority. He uh, got out and went to kindly ask from these folks to please um, turn off their music because we're trying to sleep. We're going to hike early. We're here, right? And these folks were heavily intoxicated, unfortunately. And what they came back with was, um, well, a lot of bad words that maybe I won't say here, but in short, they said, do you think you can really come and tell us what to do? These are the times of Trumps. Our guns are in the car. What do you do? It's 11, almost midnight. We had to pack up and leave. We're not going to stay next to people. Oh, and, and on top of that, they said, you can't tell us what to do because we are part of the military and we service you. And they have their guns in their cars. So it's like, I'm sorry, do not use military against the people you are telling that you serve because that is messed up. Like if you were serving me, you wouldn't be drinking your ass off and telling me that you have your guns on you so that I cannot ask you to turn down your music after quiet hours, right? Like there's just so many levels and that, you know, I wasn't even like the body that went to confront that. It was my boyfriend who's like tall white man, still happens, right? So there's just many, many, many levels of awareness and many, many levels of self-control. Because if you know you get, like somebody just said in the chat, that's militant. Yeah, if you know you get militant when you are drunk, don't get drunk in public spaces. I mean, go get drunk by yourself probably because you don't want to hurt or be threatening people around you. So obviously there are, multiple intersections of issues when we get into being considerate of others. It starts with us. It starts with trying to be our, trying to be our best selves, making sure that we are healed from our own traumas, from the, from the systems of oppression that have been, uh, you know, kind of forced upon us without us even noticing. And so this is really what today is about, just bringing an opportunity for all of us to do a little exercise and start finding easy ways that we can continuously check in with ourselves and become better, continue the healing journey. I know hiking my feelings is really all about continuing the, continuing the healing journey from, from the soul level to, you know, the physical level, because as, as we know, everything is connected. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening to our, our stories and our thoughts. And I'm now going to share my screen again so we can go into a really cool exercise that Bree is going to uh, guide us through.
Thank you so much, Gabachia. Um, I think the really important part here is that that awareness piece. And that's the muscle that we're gonna be practicing as it comes into play with the way that we hold ourselves and move through spaces and interact with each other in those spaces. So whatever brings you here for those motivations around the seventh principle, we're ready. We're gonna dig into it a little bit. This will be interactive. Um, and to have us make sense of a lot of complicated things in a very complicated world, we're gonna rely on a really simple exercise that our brain does a million times a day at hyperspeed. We're just gonna break it down into a process that we can practice. Uh, since hyperspeed also often involves smooshing steps together and expediting interpretation when we're handling or interacting with new information. And that's something that's helped us survive. That's a biological feature of our brains to make sense of something potentially dangerous and to come up with a response or to be the first one to speak up in a meeting, uh, knowing that that's a level of corporate culture or to show that we're on the same page with someone by sharing something and bridging. There are many reasons that our brains work really quickly to make those connections for us. Um, with that said, we've also internalized a lot of tricky bits, particularly from white supremacy and may not recognize when our brains are reinforcing these influences if we let our minds work the way that they want to automatically and don't take that time with it. So diver represents going deep on something we're trying to make sense of by relying on concrete facts and catching ourselves when our brains add in those judgments, may they be positive or negative, whatever associations, parallels to our own experiences and everything that our brain is ready to add on to new information. It's a framework to break down that automatic and disrupt habits and patterns of meaning making that may have assumed subconsciously and, and hold ourselves accountable to really unpacking their impact and how they inform new information that we're getting and how we're interpreting that. So let's go to the next slide. DIVER stands for describe, interpret, verify, evaluate, and re-verify. So as we're looking at this as a framework, if we're describing something, it's based entirely on things that we see in front of us without any embedded cultural influence. It's just, what do we see? Facts, textures, colors, um, very, very basic things. Interpretation, this is when we start thinking about what we're seeing and maybe it reminds us of something else, like a texture reminds us of a certain kind of substrate or a rock. Um, those are where our brain starts adding in the meeting for something that we're getting in front of us. A verification. Now, this is an opportunity that as we're making sense of things throughout the world as individuals, being able to look to an external perspective is especially important to disrupt those biases that we have just based on the limit of our own experiences and our own uh, perspective on the world in our own movement through it. So we're including that as a step in our meaning making process here to really push that piece of the consideration within others and the impact itself. Um, evaluation. So what do you feel about what you think? Start breaking apart the emotionality of this and start thinking about the different connotations that come up with new information. And then we're going to close this out with a re-verification. It is always helpful to be looking for more perspectives, different perspectives that challenge you, that may not reinforce the first thing you thought of, that really push you. And we're going to go through this practice using a visual cue. Um, so for those of you who are going to be listening, we're really going to be holding our, our group here to describing as illustrate as much as they can in detail. Um, because we're joining in a couple of different forums, I would say I'm really calling on uh, my friends Ashley, Gawachi, and Serene to, to be stepping up as part of this process. For those of you who are joining by Zoom, um, you're welcome to as well. I would say write down your thoughts in the comments and we will call on people as they come in and we go through this process to share a little bit more about where they're coming from. So does that sound like a good place to start? All right. Let's go to our photo. Okay, so if you recognize this photo, I would just ask that you keep that information to yourself. 
since we are building our muscles on interpreting new information together and the meaning making process. So there will be a moment where you can tell it's all about it. Just keep in mind, if, you ha if people haven't seen this, we really wanna go through that practice. So we'll take a moment with this. Um, I also want to add, if you are in the Zoom and you want to participate uh, vocally, we welcome you to turn on your video so that we can identify um, you as a interactive participant of, of, of the exercise. You don't have to, it's totally optional. We understand this is uh, being widely shared, but um, we hope that you will join us in that too. Thank you, Gabachia. Okay, so let's get into our descriptions here. What are we seeing? What are some observable facts in front of us? Ashley, what you got? Um, I'm seeing warm, um, warm tones such as reds and browns and looks like some green there in the background. Great. What else are we seeing? Is it just a bunch of colors? It's definitely it looks a person. Like some kind there. of desert. Okay, okay. So there looks like there's a person and looks like a desert. I'm gonna pause us here. So Serene, you've come in with an interpretation. We are starting to make sense of what we're seeing as this being potentially a desert. So what makes you think that it's a desert? Tell us what you see in front of you that, that suggests that. I see that there's not a lot of greenery or trees in the way that I associate um, like a forest. And so I see that it's more desolate looking place. The, I, I feel like I'm looking at a rock formation of some kind and the rock is more on the red yellow spectrum and smooth. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I would say that the rock formation is that of what would be an arch um, okay. with a human uh, that doesn't have a shirt on and pants and rock climbing type activities on the left hand side. So what about the, what are you seeing with the hand here that's making you think rock climbing? Cause that's an interpretation again. Sure, so I see uh, a little pouch hanging off the back of this person's body uh, and the hand is uh, like a chalky white. Okay. And the feet have like enclosed shoes on it that looks like maybe that shows me it's a rock climber of some okay. sort. And we had someone in the comments kind of come in with that interpretation too. If you're observing something else that brought you there, please do share. You're welcome to. I think we had a um, twilight hour or something that popped in the chat as well. And so from a time of day, uh, either sunrise or sunset, um, in the in the space based on um, sort of the color of the light or how it falls onto the to the valley. So let's take that a step back then. Is there a presence of light here? I'd say yes. Perfect. That's our fact. Looks like there's some lightness in this area. We think that they're maybe outside. Those are things that we can confirm in this photo. Time of day, we have ideas most likely. Right, like I see a golden hour glow on that mm -hmm. rock. So I would, I mean, I don't know where north, <laughs> south, east, west it is, but so it could, you know, it could be, I guess, uh, morning, like close to morning or close to sunset. Okay. So what are Not we thinking? Let's keep going on that trail. What are we thinking? What are we feeling about what's, what we're seeing here? Well, I would guess that it's warm because he has his shirt off. And if it was freezing cold okay. outside, he probably would not be wearing shorts and shirtless. Oh, and, you, and you're gendering. So it looks like we've got a man here. Yeah. Okay. So what got you to that? What got you to that point? As a woman, I wouldn't climb with a shirt on. So I'm <laughs> speaking from my own experience. Sure. There. 
yeah nips, nips would not be out for me uh yep. rock climbing <laughs> <laughs> And that's fair. So I would I would assume then that you haven't done that in the past. It's not your cultural norm for when you rock climbing. No, no, it's <laughs> All not. Right. Sounds like so it might be fun though. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So there's a feeling too. So there's this element of like freedom, maybe. Um, but there's this person who is outside. What are we feeling about this engagement with we've described kind of a rock formation? Like what's going on here? What do we think? Like, what are we feeling that this interaction is between human? Is it climbing? If so, describe like where that's coming from. Someone from the chat brings up a good point is that there's there's no rope. Yeah. Um, there's okay. no harness. Um, also has noticed that they're in uh, maybe Tevas or some kind of sandal thought process with the chalk bag on the back as well. I think that this person is... Uh, ascending or descending on the rock feature be actively bringing their legs up with their hands above them okay um, in the movement stance how are we feeling with that interpretation does this feel we're going to verify as a group here are we on the same track are we thinking that this is some climbing going on even ascending okay yeah yeah there's some there's some uh, suggestive placement with those limbs if we if we're if we're saying it's a he, um, he is uh, probably not alone as well. And so, mm -hmm. if there was a a person capturing this image for him uh, in the background, just from a, a angle and timing, if he did that with a tripod, he's probably pretty talented. Um, so I would I'd, <laughs> selfie. I'd say he's not a, he's the either the best selfie taker or he's not alone. So keep going with that, Ashley. Let's go deeper into the evaluation here. Uh, sure. Let us know what you're feeling a little bit more around this full scenario. Paint us a picture. What's the story? Um, for and I, I feel like it's a you know some bros uh, going out um, climbing out in the desert um, and in this like you know get this shot of me going up the rock. Um, and uh, you know if it um, just holding on holding on there and just uh people probably uh cheering him on hanging out spending some time out there with your with your group of friends okay so we're starting to get some language with coding too like not only this guy's gendered it's a dude and he's a bro we've got some story behind it is that informed by maybe something you've seen or experienced or someone you've interacted with in the past yeah yeah, I would say I would say just from this space and and I'm not I hate to generalize all rock climbers. I don't know why that that particular um, um, thought came out. It's just like I, mean, I just feel like and, and when I say bro, I just meant a bunch of dudes, not necessarily the negative connotation of bro. Um, just a group of friends coming out uh, into the group to go climbing. Yeah. OK. But there are a <laughs> lot of rock climbing bros, though, like the bad combination of bros. Yeah. I, some I folks in this... the oh. oh go ahead sorry some folks in the chat box are talking about um maybe perhaps someone is just taking the picture that's unrelated to the person mm. um and then another thought is maybe the the alignment and the placement of the rock formations behind it is pretty like accurate and centered um and then some experience in the group also talking about their own experience with quote mm -hmm. bro rock climbers lol mm -hmm. so people are feeling something around this especially that term that we've landed on sydney what's well, on your mind my my eyes are drawn towards the center so moving away from the climber but the center like what is the thing jutting out from the arch there like i i'm having a hard time identifying like i don't know if that's just on my screen but i see it on both screens that i'm looking at but it looks like there's either like a chunk of rock that's like oddly. Oh, there it oh, goes. It's it's gone now. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, <laughs> I was like, is this photoshopped? Is that the whole point of this experience? Like, I'm, I was, I was like, what is happening here? All yeah. right. All good. Yeah. Proceed. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, let's go to the next slide and think a little bit more because we're at this point. We've got a real story of what's going on. And we have some feelings about what could be going on there. Um, what's interesting in this process is that 
we do end up with those connections where we're, we're starting to fill in those blanks and we're starting to look either very positively or negatively or, or maybe not at all, but something um, around what's going on here. And I think, um, are we feeling the same? Like this is a guy that's ascending. He might be with someone else. Are we pretty much on that page? Okay. Okay. I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to agree. I think he's definitely with someone else. Um, one of the feelings that I have, I don't know. It just, it feels like I'm having a hard time because in this frame, I cannot see how tall this rock is. So my first impression was like, oh, this person is bouldering. Mm. But because I can't see the true like height of this structure that he's climbing on, like I'm not sure if, if he's just bouldering or like free soloing like a very tall structure. Yeah. And would those scenarios change how you're feeling? I know I have a aversion to super tall heights. This guy has no rope. I get terrified <laughs> by the idea of this being like a cliff. How about you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's I think it's interesting because to me it looks like an arch. So I just because I see arches behind it. The and for me, I get a little um I think I feel a little anxiety because my understanding in in interacting in the outdoors is that we're not to be climbing arches. We're not supposed to be recreating on top of the rock that is so delicate. And so part of me feels uh, a little bit of frustration trying to not tap too deep into the social work world of myself, but uh, recognizing that the um, tragedy of the commons, right? The idea that uh, we're trying our best to avoid this so that the most people can enjoy it. Hmm. But yet there's one person here who seems to be doing this um, like that. I, that sparks a little bit of, uh, it bubbles emotion in me. I feel that. Yeah. And in the comments we had, I hope he had his permit. Um, we're feeling like this person to be interacting in this way feels like they should be doing it in a certain kind of way. So we're extending some expectations on this person. Uh, Brie, can I add like, what if he's, what if he's, since we can't see, what if he's, what if he's not climbing at all? What if this is just a um, sort of an influencer in the wild staged picture um, yeah. and he actually stopped right there and went right back down and continued to hike, a, hike along the, yeah. the trail or wherever he was like would that change uh feelings or um make us feel better or worse because as I'm looking at it I'm like I'm not, maybe he's not actually going to keep going <laughs> ah. yeah I mean I think at this point we have a little bit of time it's, it's so okay we have it seems disingenuous okay so yeah we've got some judgment coming out of this too like we're making some sense of this and we are grounding what we're feeling based on what's going on here okay I feel like it it was for show the person would be oh okay so he should be looking at the camera maybe this isn't for show sure I think in the interest of time we can spend as much time as we want with a uncontextualized visual prompt and at the end of the day all we can walk away from really knowing is that it looks like there's some rocky formations Maybe there's a guy, but definitely just a human interacting in that space. And we are filling in a lot of information of possibilities based on other information that we've received and things that we've experienced. And if we don't pause in that process to, to give some space to what's informing those, we can make some, make some assumptions um, around what could be going on there. And Gabachi, I'm going to ask you to share a little bit more about the context of this one. Well, before I do, yeah. I want to, um, I want to, I just see that Tori put on his camera. So I want to invite oh, Tori to, to tell us what, what his thoughts are about this. Here, I have asked you to unmute, so maybe that will help. <laughs> okay. Um, so I haven't been able to see the chat because I was on my cell phone until just now. Um, but we're at the interpret part. Oh, we're going all the way through. We're just, we're closing oh. up, but share an interpretation, share where you're at. 
Um, yeah, I just kind of interpret it as a rock climber, maybe doing a photo shoot or something. Um, definitely got that sunset or sunrise Utah type desert mm -hmm. experience going. Um, and yeah, he's probably bouldering cause there's no ropes or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what I see. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting specific on geography here too. That's great. Yeah, but oh, yeah the, that's, one that's one true. One those red things, rocks in Utah, like association. Yeah, one of the things I didn't want to get lost was like, um, we're thinking what we were feeling. I was trying to think more of like also what he may be feeling. And so like his excitement or his exuberant to maybe even accomplish one of his goals and mm -hmm. the sort of the space that he's there and 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 trying to understand more about why and so when when he said a photo shoot like this may be um a job for him for example and or you know it could be a marketing campaign to bring awareness to something or or something like that so when, once once story said photo shoot it it sort of shifted maybe what mm -hmm. i was looking at and so it's maybe um i thought that that was interesting uh, interesting spin on it and it sort of changed sort of what I was feeling and mm -hmm. sort of like the, the space that this climber is currently in yeah and interesting that that input from the group kind of brought you to that conclusion as well it it had you elaborate and think a different direction around on this okay all right Gabachi, what are we looking at here are we ready for the truth I don't know if we are <laughs> uh but well basically what we're looking at is um this is Dean Potter, the dark wizard of Yosemite, soloing the delicate arch in Arches National Park. And if you know anything about Arches National Park, this is their most precious feature. This happened back in 2006 when the climbing regulations had a little bit of loopholes, but definitely these uh, particular event as it was broadcasted in the news and in some magazines uh, brought a lot of backlash from the climbing community. It brought a lot of action on behalf of the park service, specifically for arches and climbing regulations. I think right after there, you know, just pretty much, I think all the regulations that we know exist today came after this because the concern was this famous climber soloing Delicate Arch is gonna just promote more climbers to wanna come solo Delicate Arch. And that's not a sustainable practice. It's actually, um, in general, there's a lot of uh, concern around sustainability and uh, climbing routes because as we continue to touch those rocks and <laughs> You know, erosion is like a natural thing, but human hand on it over and over and over again, it's mm -hmm. definitely a larger concern and in, in, in our impacts there. Mm -hmm. So Dean Potter back in 2006, when this happened, um, you know, they, he had multiple interviews and, and he did a good job of admitting that he never even considered the fact that this may be a illegal or b uh, detrimental to the park and the landmark that he was climbing. Mm -hmm. So, if, if we go yeah. to, I think it's not the next one, but the the slide after, we have a couple of snippets there. Um, okay. I think we've kind of jumped into a really complicated cultural space, and and not knowing everyone's individual. Oh, the next one after that, everybody's individual familiarity with climbing. Um, I would encourage you to look into this and to look from voices like Melanin Basecamp around the impacts of a culture where somebody like this can feel like they are entitled to do this and not have those ramifications at top of mind. This tells us a lot about where we're at within our outdoor culture and gives us a sense of a lot of blind spots in terms of what's informing our actions within it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Bree. And, you know, we, we did this exercise for the purposes of our own, you know, internalized, like, 
understanding how just everyone in this Zoom call had, we had a lot of intersecting approaches, uh, but that also means that we have a lot of intersecting experiences, right? Like we've already experienced climbing to a certain degree that we could identify. Um, for a lot of us, we identified the little chalk bag that he was carrying around his waist. Uh, for others, there, there was a comment about the, the Tiva shoe. So yeah, you know, that, that photo maybe didn't have the best quality. So that shoe could have been another kind of shoe. Um, I understood that, that it was a climbing shoe from my own personal experience going shopping for climbing shoes. But definitely that, um, you know, that, that came up as a, as a difference. And, mm -hmm. you know, making the assumptions about the geographical location, the gender of the person, um and and all of those things yeah so yeah and i think um on our next slide this being a practice this is something that ultimately we're seeing a lot of visuals outside of context we are interacting with people that we don't know or are getting to know and this exercise is a really it's, it can be a humbling way to remind ourselves of of how we are making sense of what we are perceiving and seeing around us so recognizing the importance of a point of reference and, and from within what context you first interact with something. I know looking at fly fishing, I had a really positive experience because I had family who could loan me gear and I had a father-in-law who would take me out and it was, a, it was a welcoming, lovely experience. And that is a huge privilege. Um, and that is, you know, that allowed me to have a positive first interaction, which is not always the case in outdoor spaces. And being aware of that and being aware that there are differences in terms of our first entry points, but also how we move within them or choose not to, or you know, look elsewhere um, is really important. And all of this knowing that it's, it's based on our identities that we hold in our personal experience, which I love this exercise because it requires us to hold ourselves to external verification for looking beyond ourselves and really making an effort to do so. This is something that is especially important, I would say, of anybody on this call and listening in. If you hold wide identities in this moment, this is something you need to be figuring out ways and habits of in implementing this as a pattern of your behavior to ensure that it's not coming, your decisions aren't coming from a purely white experience. Um, and think about the expectations we hold. When we were looking at this photo, we had expectations around you know, permitting around uh, gear and knowledge, like what kind of person should feel like they should do this. And that brings up a lot of emotions, which further complicate the way we make sense of things. If we think to some of our most confused or misunderstood moments, uh, more often than not, there's something that you can feel in your body that's happening. You feel like a tightness in your chest or a flush in your face. And that changes your comfort level in that instance. And it also changes what your interpretation is based on what those emotions are giving you for information. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for, for those remarks, Brie. Um, I think Sydney, we are at time. Yeah. Great. So we, we don't, we don't want to take up more space, but I hope that everybody got something out of this, that everybody feels like this is applicable, that this is something that they can just practice in, in general, even when you're out there, like hanging out with your family at a picnic or on a trail. I think this is, this is a great way to start assessing how you dive into those first responses that we get when we see something that was maybe unexpected or something that we don't have a lot of information about. And we can be very quick to create stories. We created tons of stories. There were, uh, we were shooting ads, films, uh, posting for Instagram, <laughs> uh, you know, getting permits uh, to reach a goal, uh, all sorts of things. So I hope this was a good illustration of that and that it inspires you to do a little bit more of it. Yeah, well, and thank you from a personal perspective. I was the first person to gender the person climbing. So thank you for the call on that. Cause I did, I was like, yeah, no, my nipples would not be on that rock. So I appreciate the, the opportunity to reflect how like, but it's interesting because this process is so, like you were saying, it is so automatic. It is so, this is what my brain sees. This is what I recognize. And that, I mean, like, I don't, I don't think that, and to impact over intent, like, I don't think it's a, I don't think I was intending harm by assuming that this was a man, obviously, but that is where my brain goes. And that's something to be super mindful of. Cause 
this is just looking at a picture of a rock, let alone all the experiences that you guys shared. Like this is what we're talking about when we talk about be considerate of others. So automatically our brains are like, Ooh, you're like this. This is, I'm trying to categorize. And that's, that's what humans do. Like we're very mechanical beings in that way. Um, but being aware of that process, I think is a tremendous, uh, a way to reflect. And, um, to your point, Brie, about understanding like especially if we're holding white identities and cisgender identities and like dominant culture identities this is a really good opportunity to sit down with this process even just looking at pictures like this to start to re recognize how quickly we make these assumptions so thank you for this thank you all of you guys for your time um i really appreciate having you here and where can people find you individually let's just go around the circle where can everybody follow you um on the internet and in life uh gabachi let's start with you Hello, you can find me at hikingmyfeelings.org, but you can also, in addition, find me at gabachia.com. That's G-A-B-A-C-C-I-A.com. You can also find me at outdoorfuture.org. You can find me at platformmagazine.me, and you can also find me at confluencecollective.org. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank and you. And I'll just put it in the chat. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> How about you, Ashley? I want to keep it simple. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the gentleman lumberjack. Uh, you can also find me at fishing for all uh, as well. Uh, and I hope to see you all later. Find me and I'll find you back. Yes. Serene, how about you? Uh, well, I don't have a fancy website. I will just say <laughs> you can find me at fatty on the fly on Instagram and Facebook. Um, it's just fatty, like you would say, F-A-T-T-Y on the fly. Um, and also Confluence Collective. I don't know. Am I on there? Who knows yet? But <laughs> that's that's why I'm here to for that. Fantastic. And last but certainly not least, Bree, where can we find you? Yes, I would echo and say confluencecollective.org. Our website is in process. We are going through a big overhaul to ensure the utmost transparency around how we operate and ways that we work with each other to make sure that mutual mutuality is at the basis of all of it. So I would encourage you to keep, keep in touch that way. You can sign up for our newsletter. Um, we're all on Instagram because we are visually and socially deprived these days. So I'm at uh, happy platypus with an underscore between them. Um, and you can also see some artsy stuff that I do at bridosti.com. Uh, but ultimately, if you see someone in a green hat on the water in Maine, it is definitely me. Fantastic. Yay. And Tori, because you've got your camera up, where can we find you? <laughs> I'm getting faster at that. Sorry. Um, I'm on Instagram at Tori Fly Fishes. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate your time. And up next, we have Shane Hall. He is a blues musician here in San Diego, the winner of the San Diego Music Academy Awards for the Best Blues Album 2020. And um, a little quick information, a soul accounting of human conditions in a blues driven Americana style feel is the key ingredient as well as the inevitable result and the experiencing of the Shane Hall sound travel experience and growth have shaped his artist and has shaped this artist in the undeniable real honesty that resonates clear and present resonating with everyone in some way shape or form powerful vocals and unique guitar styles are the tools used to express vision and perspective the whole sonic experience is a product of a lifetime commitment to the creation and performance of music you can feel and what makes you feel hey shane how are you well hello it's been a minute. I'm well. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. You wanna you wanna strum a couple times so we can see how the guitar sounds? S sure. Yes. How's that? Fantastic. So I understand you are at Pacific Coast Spirits. What have you been up to for uh I'll give you a reminder. We met at the privateer in Oceanside and like 2018 when Kaleo was doing pepper wine events so um, right, right. you have been on a journey since then now you're with law records you're making beautiful music you're winning music awards like what has shane been up to in the last three years man um hustling and now just hustling with with fire like having uh having support building a support structure and you know being able to do more and do more better 
Yes, I love that. Um, one of the things that I was interested in chatting with you about today is you were primarily doing stuff around San Diego when I met you. What was your music career kind of looking like between like 2018, 2019, leading up to the pandemic? It was um, it was a, a snowball, like rolling faster, growing bigger. Um, I had in 2008 or 19, I had like three or three festivals, I think, and a couple cameos with Pepper and various things. And then in uh, by the end of 2019, I had seven festivals booked for 2020 to include uh, Coachella, Electric Forest, Telluride Blues and Brews Festival, to name a few. Um, a couple uh, collaborations and stuff in the works, but all that got kind of shut down uh, over the 2020 range. But I just kind of pivoted hard in the hustle and um, recorded a lot of records, built my team out, uh, added my management, uh, Sully Artist Services, and um, you know, just kind of built uh, a firm basis of content and such for him to be able to work with to help build out my 2021 in the future. Nice. So, what what do you what were some of the lessons that um, you could take away from 2020 that are setting you up for success this year? I mean. Um, it only goes as far as you push it. And it doesn't matter if it's raining or if it's sunny or if you're sick or if you're tired, like it's only gonna happen with your actions. You know, it, it's not gonna happen to you. It's gonna happen for you. So just find a way, man. Like um, I adapt the hustle to all aspects of, the, of my life, not just music, so. If I need something in a certain area, I find a way, you know, and um, but lucky for me, I had enough infrastructure going going into 2020 that it wasn't super hard to stay present musically. Even though I was doing a lot of streaming and stuff, which is super weird, but uh, <laughs> I uh, figured that out and kind of leaned into it. And, you know, here I am on the other side about the about the ramp up again. Yeah, and I think um, the most recent single, if I'm not mistaken, was your contribution to the house that Bradley built, um, a compilation of songs that just absolutely blow my mind. Honestly, that whole album is fantastic. Um, tell me a little bit about the process of doing that um, under my voodoo. What was like, how did the invite happen? What was recording it like in this day and age where we're doing this now? Like, how long was that process for you start to finish? Yeah, um, so Paul uh, Paul Milbury, he's the GM for uh, Law Records. Um, I'm pretty sure that the whole thing might have been his his brainchild, his, his baby. And um, he brought it to me in late 2019, I think. And he's like, hey, I want you involved in this. You know, um, it's going to be a pretty big deal. Uh, and he explained the project and I was super stoked. But I, I mean, I, I'm a Sublime fan to a point, but I didn't go deep catalog. You know, I don't. And I knew that like from the artists that I saw that were going to be involved, I'm like, man, all the cool songs that I know are going to be snatched up. I don't know what to do. So I started like digging through like deep catalog stuff from Sublime and found a lot of cool songs, but I still run into the problem. Like all the songs that I picked, either somebody else was doing or they weren't original Sublime songs. They were covers that they did. And uh, and then Paul's like, you know what? This song's pretty cool that you picked, but it's, it's a cover. But why don't you try Under My Voodoo? And I was like, really? And I listened, because I know that I knew the song, but it's a pretty wild, pretty wild song. I'm like, all right, well, let me listen to it again. And and I listened to it and it just kind of clicked that I could do a, a reduced, like straightforward kind of Delta, Delta-esque version of it. And it just kind of clicked and it was, and I did a live recording at my friend's studio in the middle of the night and sent it over to Paul. And he was like, this is dope. We'll take it. It'll work. And bam, there it is. 
Wow. That easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the virtual campfire, it's kind of like we're jamming around a campfire, having conversations and such like that. So if you have a song you'd like to share, let's let's do that. Let's go for one. And then um, we'll come back around and I have some more questions for you. OK. All right. This is called uh, The Embers. There came a time I was compromised Shook my world with inner divide and I It burned so low A moment's place you don't decide And a regret's face you cannot hide And I feel their members glow I feel those embers glow I'm burning high in my touch ignite equal destruction of love and life and i struggle for control caught is the way you only move at night conceal what burns with chill and ice and i feel the members glow I feel those embers glow wrote it in um, I think it was 2015 I was living in downtown San Diego in uh, one of the towers down there smart corner and that was really cool I had like a view of the city and uh, this was this is on the record uh, called human condition and it is probably one of the first songs that I wrote where I was like okay I'm finally writing how I want to write and sounding how I want to sound and this is great and I'm excited. So uh, that song is, it's called um, Embers or and the Embers Glow. It's about keeping your fire lit for what you're passionate about, you know, and being passionate about yourself and um, just not letting anything kind of smother that flame that's going in and going on inside you. I, that, <laughs> There's so many ways that I want to go with that. So we have a program <laughs> called Blaze Your Own Trail to Self Love. And that's like the core tenet of it is like, 
if you don't know where the fire is, let's help you find it kind of thing. Right. So then you can like blaze this path. And our theme um, each month here on the virtual campfire, we have a theme. Last month was grateful for change. February is self care is community care. So I'm curious when you were on the road doing festivals, like how does Shane take care of himself so he can like keep that fire lit? I mean, um, it's about kind of knowing yourself, you know, and accepting that and uh, being true to that. Like, don't try. I'm, I don't try to do more than I can do. And I don't try to be somebody that I'm not, which eliminates a whole lot of crap that I would have to deal with if I did. It's a hard work trying to pretend to be somebody else. So I do that. Um, plus, it's also trying to enjoy the moments. And for me, uh, I might have oversimplified it, but like happy happiness in life is a simple math problem. It's like if you have more happy moments and sad moments, you're good. Like, and you try and maximize those. So for me, it's like being in the moment when it's, and especially if it's enjoyable or if it's something that you're going to look back on. So being in the festivals, it's like, I never really went to festivals before I started playing them. So for me, it's new experiences and, you know, the memories of those and being present in those moments. Um, and it's also like embracing when shit does go bad, like feeling that and allowing that to be a thing and then overcoming it, you know, is the, is the thing, but not panicking. <laughs> I guess it's easier that's the said than done. Right. Some people. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm not, I'm not like a 25 year old out there trying to do the rock and roll thing. Like I've been around for a while and, you know, I feel like a 25 year old cause I'm still on the brink of all these new experiences and stuff. So I'm super grateful, full of gratitude. I think that helps a lot too. Like just being happy and thankful for where I'm at makes things a lot easier for me. Absolutely. And I, I think and as it pertains to self care and managing what we can manage. I think a, a phrase that comes to mind is control the controllables. And in the world of music, in the world of anything, really, there's so much that is out of our control and being able to get in touch and like get back into our bodies and be present in those moments is really a, a nice way to, to manage things we can. Um, so when you, when you hear the phrase self-care is community care, what does that mean to you? Like, what kind of visual does that stir up? What kind of experiences does that remind you of? Um, well, I mean, for the better I am, the better I can be for others. Um, and, you know, and the more I care for my community, the more it cares for me or the better it the environment is for me. So I'm a uh, pretty big into like, like Oceanside, that's where I live. So I do a lot up here with the community. But um, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's just doing the best you can for yourself and for others and it will come back kind of thing. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I think it's that speaks a lot to what you were talking about with building out your team and having that infrastructure in place. Like you at some point, like right before you had the opportunity to go do festivals, to get with law, to make these new uh, tracks, to book a, a great idea of a tour for 2020, was there ever a moment where you're like, oh, this is happening, like this is it, like now it's go time? Or was it just kind of like one thing after the other, just kind of like that snowball building? Um. No, nah, I was just, I was relieved and happy that it was happening. Um, so like up until like 2019, 2018, January would roll around and I'd be all bummed out because January is kind of break time for the industry. And a lot of stuff starts to get booked out at that time. So if your phone's not ringing, if you don't have the first couple months of the new year booked out and it's January, you're not really doing anything of note. Um, 
So, but 2018, 19, 20, I wasn't even realized it was January. Stuff's popping off, and I was just like, yes, this is exactly where I want to be. <laughs> so, and I was just kind of gearing up. But I, I don't know. I, I know I knew it was coming. Like, not really the shape or size of it, but I could just tell. Like, all the shit just keeps happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the phone keeps ringing and the opportunities yeah. keep knocking and I keep saying yes. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, yeah. So what do you have um, planned for 2021? What's that? What's life looking like for you this year? Is there a plan? Because <laughs> 2020 <Yeah>. was wild. <laughs> 2021 is... Um, it's kind of a new... It's a new... It's a new lease on, on entertainment because... People are hungry, so we're going to be doing like private events. I'm going to be helping other musicians in the area play events. Um, when cities and venues are reopened, like they're going to be stoked to have anybody coming through to play. I don't think the bigger bands are going to tour this year because it's kind of too late to book that stuff out. <laughs> but it leaves it wide open for the independents and the small artists if we're willing to put in the work and uh that is definitely me so i'm already we're going to utah next month we're going to park city we're playing a couple shows there at uh op ruckwell cocktail lounge and music hall it's going to be their first show in that area so hopefully i'm making a lot a lot of new fans because i think people are going to come out just because it's music and something to do right um, yeah i'll just pretend they already knew who i was was they ain't for me <laughs> and uh, got plans Colorado and um yep um so we got we got stuff popping up here and there I'm still on the bill for Telluride uh, I don't know if it's gonna happen or not but yeah man as, as stuff comes available I am going to be there and ready I like it um, well, so we have the close of our show is the group gratitude circle where we go around and talk about what we're grateful for. Um, do you have another song that you'd like to share with us before we move into our circle of gratitude? Sure. Awesome. So I'm over here at PCS um, Pacific Coast Spirits in Oceanside. Uh, it's one of the newer spots around town, and they uh, I play here pretty often, and they're so gracious to loan us their Wi-Fi and space. So they're they're like they got to turn all their house music off, and I'm over here just jamming in the corner <laughs> with you guys. Pretty yeah, funny. I we do the same thing. I'm at Beach Hut Deli in Rancho San Diego. I'm like music off. Uh, I'm in the back patio. It's all good. So yeah, we're jacking Wi-Fi too. It's so nice. Thank you, community organizations that support independent artists and podcasters. We appreciate you. <laughs> good looking out. Won't be a minute, won't be long. I want you to witness what's going on. It's me, baby. I'm coming on strong. Come on, baby. Don't you want to come? Stand up, babe. It might be a fight. When you love me, you love and right. One more minute, one more touch, one more second might be too much. One more breath, baby, just one more breath, one more, one more. Gonna put you to the test. Stand up, babe. There might be a fight. When 
loving you love me you love in Thank you, sir. <sighs> so, tell me stories. Um, what's that song? What's it about? Where were you? I was in my living room. Uh, 2016. Um, it's just about love. It's called Love Big. So it's about, you know, um, loving fearlessly and not holding back and uh just kind of kind of like the rock and roll appro approach to young love <laughs> yes i Sounds dig really it good with I, the so, band and horns <laughs> oh gosh i'm a sucker for our horn section so um as of right now on your schedule what are you doing in june no idea Cool. cool. So I think you should probably come to Chicago and we can do a virtual campfire in person. We'll get you in a blues club Deal. and we're doing our take a hike diabetes campaign up there. And I need some like awesome music to jam by the fire with and or in a little loungy space. All right. Well, I will put you in contact with the person to make that happen. <laughs> but I'm down. Chicago is where my heroes are from. So I'm That's down, right. down, down, down. Fantastic. Well, right. my favorite well, question to so ask much. about, yeah, one more before you go. My favorite question to ask um, our musical guests and anybody in general, um, if you, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, and if there's anything on your heart and mind that you, if you had a magic wand and you could just like wave it and people would come to an understanding or something would stop happening, um, what would that be? uh bigotry and um you know whew, man that's a loaded question girl what are you doing um that's uh <laughs> yeah bigotry you know pe nobody is is better you know um and i wish you could just educate with a tap of a wand and not allow people to be taken advantage of, I think is the most important thing. That's, that's the thing that bugs me a lot. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And huge I think scales. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's, we were talking with um, some folks last week and that was integrity was one, like we wish everybody could be just like blessed with integrity. Um, and accountability has been a theme this month as well. Like just people being held accountable for their actions, people taking personal accountability too. So I think we're all kind of on the same wavelength as far as the things we'd like to see. end. Um, and on that note, while everybody else, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody else, um, go ahead and put on your camera. If you want to join the group gratitude circle, Shane, I'd love to have you kick us off. Um, and you're free to free to scoot after you let us know, but what are you grateful for? Uh-oh. Lost you again. <laughs> no worry, Shane. What are you grateful for? Okay. Uh, I'm grateful for this right now, right here. I'm grateful that I'm breathing. I'm grateful that sunshine outside right now. Grateful for my kids. 
Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm grateful for you and your presence. So thank you for being here. And um, thank you for sharing your oh. music with us. Cool. Thank you so much. Just happy to be here. And let's talk about Chicago. Thanks, everybody else. Have a good one. Appreciate you. All right. Miss Gabacho, what are you thankful for? I'm also thank you for here today. Thankful for here and today, but um, special gratitude for having Bree, Serene, and Ashley in my life. Fantastic. Ashley, what are you thankful for? Me, Ashley, or the other Ashley? <laughs> yes, a a Ashley Cortez. My apologies. <laughs> what are you thankful for? I'm not used to having two Ashleys. <laughs> I know. I will, and I'm certainly not used to seeing uh, men with the name Ashley, even though that is what actually it started out as. Um, I am thankful for music and always on Thursdays having, you know, a little sneak peek back into what live music was once like. Um, and I'm really thankful that I got my, <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous. I got new pillow cases for my couch and they're all super rad, like mountainscapes and whatnot. Ooh, and I'm I really love grateful to bring some of the indoor outdoors in. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us today. Tori, how about you? What are you thankful for? I am, thanks. I am so, so grateful to uh, start meeting the Confluence Collective. And this is my first campfire chat with you guys. And just like, thank God for the internet right now, because it's allowing me to tap in with uh, like diversity fly fishers and other outdoors people that I just don't uh, have in my life. And I'm so grateful right now for this new community and I just want to like be part of it a hundred percent all the time so thank you yes thank you for being here it's so nice to meet you it's nice to see new faces and um connect with new folks so we appreciate you being here Serene how about you what are you thankful for well today I took a swim in the river um it's very cold and very icy and so I'm thankful to be uh alive and um, be healthy and safe and I'm um, not always those things so uh, glad to be here and thanks for having me this is awesome and really fun and uh, I can't help but just be so incredibly grateful for people being uh, vulnerable and open and honest with their stories and um, the journey that we're on each and every day is just it's it's actually miraculous that we're alive so thankful that all of you are alive at the same time that I am. Yeah. It's uh, if I spend some time thinking about that, it really trips me out. Like what a miracle it is that all of us were born and are existing on this planet hurling through space. It's pretty wild when you take away all the, all the conditioning and all the rules. So yes, thank you, Serene. And thank you for your contributions today. It was great to hear some of your story as well. Yeah. Brie, thanks. Miss Brie, I think you're the last one here. What are you grateful for? Oh, for so many things, but namely for the perpetual humbling that amazing people provide as you interact with more and more of them. And it just lifts your spirits and makes you feel like so much more is possible than what you can even conceptualize for yourself. So I am so thankful for sharing this lived experience. Yes. Well, I am thankful for everybody that joined us today. Gabaccia, Serene, Ashley, both Ashleys, uh, Bree and Tori and all of our normal folks that join us for the virtual campfire. Thank you so much. Um, Gabachi and the Confluence Collective team, thank you for bringing your expertise. Thank you for sharing your stories um, and for helping us all see where we can do better and how we can do that. Um, always a good reminder and a nice refresher to step into that space and really be present and hear um, just how much is out there that we don't understand. But one of the things that we always come back to here at Hiking My Feelings is just that we've all been through some stuff and the hardest day of my life and the hardest day of your life may be very dramatically different. Um, but the fact that we're all here to talk about it is a miraculous 
beautiful thing. So thank you for sharing your stories and for doing this in an open forum. I know we had originally planned on this being for one of our programs and we appreciate you guys adapting this for the virtual campfire so this can be available far and wide. So um, for all the folks on YouTube, thank you for tuning in. Come check us out next week. We have Ray Zaragoza. Um, she is a fantastic, fantastic artist. She is. Uh, she just released her new album called Woman in Color and we will be chatting with her and I am totally blanking on who my other guest is. Oh, uh, Rubina is a, um, she is a family therapist um, for families of color. And she will be here as well to share a little bit about her practice um, and just different mechanisms for coping and ways that we can be aware of how we can support the people in our community. So thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you uh, next week. Everybody on YouTube, we're gonna wave goodbye. And then people on Zoom, you're